Welcome to the Elevate the Vibe podcast, bringing you juicy convos with thought leaders discussing the wild world of parenting. We really start off with everybody's an artist. We just have to find your type of art that fits you and what makes you happy. Uh, and I tell them all the time, like, you're not going to like everything we do, but we're going to find what, what you do like. Uh, and just building up that confidence. That clip was from our guest to the show today, Amber Seiler Viscosil. My name is Katie Berlin. I'm the host of the Elevate the Vibe podcast. And with me is my very handsome hubby, Jason Berlin. Hi, beautiful. How are you? Oh, I'm feeling pretty good now. You know, it's nice. It's Sunday. The sun has finally stopped beating us up so much. It's been so hot and it's really refreshing that the weather has, is on our side now. LA weather is cooling down temporarily, even though we're in our office right now and I am actually sweating. I personally have sweat dripping off my forehead. <laughs> I wasn't going to mention the forehead sweat. <laughs> but uh, yes, it is cooling off. Yeah. Thankfully. Speaking of cooling off, winding down, enjoying life, this year has been a roller coaster for many people. Uh, we are no exception to that. But there are constants and steadies in life that give you an outlet and give you the opportunity to connect with yourself and make you feel as if time almost stops and you can escape. For some people, that can be watching a movie or a TV show, it could be playing music, and for some people, it's art. Art has been something in my family for generations, actually. Uh, my grandpa was the president of a painter's union. My mom is a watercolor painter, and she just creates the most beautiful landscapes and beautiful scenes with her watercolor. She's very gifted and very talented. Unfortunately, I didn't receive those artistic gifts. I was more of a music person, but I still appreciate all forms of art, whether it be sculpting, painting, paper mache, or even macaroni sculptures. When I was growing up, one of my favorite activities was to be really crafty and paint and create little arts and crafts. I had a, a little desk at my dad's house and I would use it to store all my little goodies and I would color on a piece of paper with markers, uh, just like cool shapes and patterns, and then cut that into a spiral design. I would color the paper on both sides, cut it into a spiral design. And then I would create almost like little spiral pinwheels that I would hang from my ceiling all over my room. So it'd be these really cool little art installations that I would create for myself. Now, I wasn't necessarily an amazing illustrator or painter, but I always loved the craft of it. I do have a brother who's an extremely gifted artist. He did go to a school in Maryland called MICA, Maryland Institute College of Art not easy to get into and he did go on a scholarship he's extremely gifted and as jason mentioned he's more of you know a music person and my brother ultimately went the music route but it seems like maybe art and music go hand in hand they both give you a massive appreciation for creativity in this world and creativity is really the crux of this many people think that oh i'm not creative or I don't have those capabilities, but everyone is creative. Everyone has capabilities. Sure, maybe you, you don't mold something out of clay or maybe you don't paint a beautiful watercolor, but there's creativity in every single one of us. It's just a way to pull that out and to nurture it. And it doesn't matter what it looks like, but when you tap into it, it feels amazing. So today's guest, Amber, is a friend of mine who we grew up together. You'll hear a little backstory about a memory that I have of an artistic time, you know, even from when we were seven or eight years old. But Amber is an elementary school art teacher in Hartford County, Maryland. She has both a bachelor's in fine arts and master's in art education and over 15 years working with students to nurture their creative abilities. Not all children, just like adults, feel like they're creative and Amber's goal is to take the child who doesn't like art and have it become their favorite subject and the reason why they want to come to school. Amber's passion extends beyond modalities like colored pencils, paint, and clay where she uses art as a vehicle to teach about subjects like environmental education, anti-racism, and personal empowerment. Let's welcome Amber to the show.
Amber, welcome to the Elevate the Vibe podcast. Can you please introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Um, my name is Amber Seiler Viscosal, and I work in a public uh, elementary school in Maryland. Uh, I teach children from kindergarten up to fifth grade, and um, I really love what I do. I've been teaching for 14 years. So it's, it's, it's my, definitely my passion. And your focus for your students is on art. Yes. So I definitely focus on like choice-based art and having them make decisions. So I kind of consider myself more of a facilitator of learning to help them kind of discover the different areas of art and just experiment and find what they like. So what got you into art in the first place? Do you have a mom or dad who are into it? I know my mom is into watercolors. My grandpa was into oils. So uh, what was what was your foray into art? Um, my mom was super crafty and she was always sewing or doing, you know, the old time, like 90s thing of stenciling the wall. She nice. did all that stuff. Um, and my dad kind of had a little art background. And I remember I was like eight years old. He took me to... Towson Artist Supply, which was like a legit real art store for artists. Um, and he bought me a sketchbook and a how to draw book and a charcoal pencil. So I, he just sat down and took time with me. Um, my grandma took time with me too. Like everybody would sit and draw with me. Uh, and then just a little positive feedback from an art teacher. And I was like, okay, art's, art's my thing. I'm good at. <laughs> That's awesome. I still cannot do a straight line, no matter how much I've tried. My handwriting <laughs> is like a third grader still. Have uh, you I need, I need a little bit of help. You draw the circle like, oh. and you try to do a perfect circle. You said there's an app for that? Because I would probably app. crash that app. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you it's right up your alley <laughs> but I, I was more of a music person so yeah. now when you were growing up and your parents you know you're saying that they spent time and they would sit down with you and begin to teach you a little bit or give you that space to learn mm -hmm. was it because they had that background and they appreciated it or was it because they already saw something in you and they saw your excitement so they began to nurture it I'm, I'm really not sure what came first. Um, I think naturally girls like to sit and color and draw a lot. Um, so I, I think it kind of was just an activity I enjoyed. And I can remember being art class was always my favorite. Um, so I think that I probably expressed interest. And then each of my parents kind of did it their own way um, of encouraging and really getting me in art more. And I definitely self advocated for myself. Like I remember in Maryland, we have a gifted and talented program. So um, you are selected to be in that program. And I remember in sixth grade, I wasn't selected. And I was like, no, I should, I should be in this program. So I like went to my teacher. I'm like, how do I, how do I get in? What do I do? Uh, and she, she told me like, you stay after school, you make a portfolio, we can help you. And by seventh grade, I was in this gifted program. So, and my parents are always like, my mom would always call the school and be like, my daughter is doing this, or we want to sign up for this. <laughs> okay. I feel like this could be like a super throwback for, but for the audience, Amber and I grew up together. So we've known each other probably for almost 30 years. Yeah. Probably. yeah. Was the middle school teacher Miss? Pemberton is that was that her name not the one that I had okay I don't I don't remember their names but anyway but for context yeah <laughs> to give you an idea of how even when we were young Amber was already crafty and definitely showed an interest in this so you had a birthday party I want to say it was maybe like you were turning seven maybe you were turning eight I don't remember but we had a little craft that we did where we had hats, just like plain hat, you know, like a baseball cap that you would wear. And we all decorated our hats. We had like gems. We bedazzled? had, did you bedazzle? we, we totally bedazzled and we had like cool glue that was different mm -hmm. colors nice. and we got to write on it. And like, I remember this, <laughs> like, I remember it so specifically and it was so cool and I'm like man I wish I still had that hat like I, you know I don't know what happened to it you don't still have those do you <laughs> I that's a lost memory I did not remember that but when you said that I'm like imagining the puppy paint and the rhinestones and just mm. 
<laughs> yeah. So it's something that like as kids, we all are creative in a different mm-hmm. way, even as adults, but we're all creative in different ways. And like you're saying, there are times where somebody recognizes that in you and they can push it forward. And there are times when you know that you're creative and for you to even be a young person, you know, middle school age and say like, no, I should be in this program was pretty profound. So when you are working with children and they hear, or they've heard, you know, I, I'm not creative or I don't think I'm creative because maybe so-and-so over here's parents have already spent five years of putting them into some intensive illustrative class and they're drawing like Mona Lisa. (laughs) And then this person works really well with cubism yeah. or like, yeah, (laughs) puff paint and bedazzling. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, it's still art. Picasso. Yeah. So (laughs) as a teacher, how do you nurture that and work through that with children? Um, Well, the best part about my job is I have them at five years old at kindergarten and I am with them all six years. So I really do get to nurture um, the creativity in them. We really start off with everybody's an artist. We just have to find your type of art that fits you and what makes you happy. Uh, And I tell them all the time, like, you're not going to like everything we do, but we're going to find what what you do like. Uh, And just building up that confidence. And that's the beauty of elementary school. You like you were talking about drawing a straight line. You draw a line for them. They their eyes just light up. They're so excited. Um, we do sound effects when we draw lines in kindergarten. They just are so excited that they can do that. So it's kind of like building blocks. So I get them drawing those lines and then they're more confident drawing a face or a person. And you try to do that with middle or high school and they're just like, want to rip their paper up and be like, nah, it doesn't look like me. (laughs) I could imagine that you see a lot of kids who they have a lot of creative tendencies or they're already um like they already have the knack for it like you see it coming to life and you're like wow like you already have a a special talent now on the other hand if there are children that do it doesn't necessarily like come to life immediately if they start to feel discouraged how can you keep them engaged and interested so that they just don't feel like, well, this isn't for me and I'm going to like throw my hands up. This is like that. What you just said is like my goal, like to get the kid who hates art to turn around and say, eh, art's okay. And then to get them to be like, nope, art's the only subject I like. Like that's what I want to do is to reach those kids that are just throwing their paper, crumpling up their pencils and like, or throwing their pencil, crumpling up their paper. Um, So really, I just try to connect on a personal level with them, find out if they're into like, oh, like construction equipment or cars or video games and start drawing those things. If they are obsessed with the video game, we can draw that and then we can branch out a little bit. So I really try to connect and and be able to walk away, which is a huge lesson to learn uh, as a teacher. You have to be able to give the child space to try and fail and try again. You can't always just swoop in. I don't like to give new pieces of paper, which sometimes that can be an issue that can be a tantrum, but um, trying to reach the child and say, mistakes happen, we have to fail artists fail. Like this is a part of our life here and just keep going. Um, and then you just have to get so excited when they don't give up and they try again. And it, it's just really about your excitement for their success, even if it's a little thing. I think that there are so many school programs where maybe funding is cut and like some of the first programs that go can be like music, like Jason mm-hmm. said, he's super interested in that growing up or art or other programs that are really imperative for children to be able to express themselves, yeah. but they're they're taken away and then the child may not necessarily have the opportunity to have the outlet or develop mm-hmm. that ability. So in your 15 years that you've been teaching, have you ever had that situation happen where maybe not your school system, but like neighboring school systems or other teachers have been through this and what that looks like for kids when that is taken away? 
Yeah, I think my mind automatically goes to Baltimore City. Um, that just the funding there is horrendous with where the money goes. So like art teachers might be split between schools or they might have like a class where they have several grade levels in it. Um, the teachers have to get so creative. Like one of my teacher friends made a special spot on the carpet because she didn't have enough chairs and desks. So kids would earn this special spot. So I, I think definitely um, just the mental health issue of art as an outlet. And I always like when I do my Instagram from school, I always do hashtag art keeps kids in school because that might be the reason they want to go to school that day because it's Tuesday and they have art that day. So I, I think that teachers find ways to give kids what they need. And that's kind of like our fault and our like best asset because <laughs> we do all this, you know, for free or in our own free time. Um, so I think teachers, even classroom teachers, are going to find a way to get art to the kids and give the outlets, even if there's budget cuts. And teachers do free clubs after school. And um, my county is not allowed to do the um, crowdsourcing funding, but other like Baltimore City is. So teachers will hop on there and start a page and get donors and get what they need for their kids, which is amazing. I could see having parents buy into it, be a big piece of that, really advocating for the school and for that opportunity. So let's say that before the children even enter school, like they're young, um, you know, preschool age, even younger, are there any ways that like parents like Jason and I could begin to introduce and facilitate this for like very young children and kind of let their creativity shine and let them have exposure to it in, in different ways that mm -hmm. when it comes time that they enter school, they're already like psyched about it. They're like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, I'm into yeah. this. So I have a couple of friends with um, like two to four year olds and I'll do paint nights with them. And we just talk about just little things like how to take care of the brush and the paint, like technique stuff, how to take care of it. Um, and we come up with funny little sayings, like you tickle the paint with the brush so they're not jamming it. You just make it all a game. Um, with, I know boys are stereotypically, they don't like to sit still as long as girls. Um, I don't know what's true and what's stereotype, but um, you can find ways to still be creative and have movement. So they could run like a line or, you know, build rock sculptures or write in the dirt, get dirty, mud, whatever. Um, so definitely creative play. I know there's these kits they sell, uh, but you could obviously make one and there'll be like a, a box, a clear box, and it'll have like rice or, or <laughs> sand or something in it and little toys. And the kids just put things together, take them apart. Um, so anything where they're putting together and taking apart and finding new creative ways to do that. So it's all about play. <laughs> I find that like our child who is two, about to be two and a half, is way more interested in playing with rocks and sticks and dirt and leaves than yeah. any sort of toy yeah. and he likes to roll his markers under the fridge versus actually using them on his little he has a little marker board thing and he'd rather just chuck them under the fridge yeah we <laughs> did one of one of the ways that we've been trying to implement like utilizing markers or playing with crayons because there's a lot of surfaces that we don't necessarily want to get covered <laughs> with like you know marker crayon or paint but we did buy these markers that they only work if you write on the paper yeah, and then mess so, free Crayolas. Yeah. yeah. So that's been really good as a starter. And then we also one day did like a finger painting exercise mm -hmm. with him outside and had glitter and like poured the glitter in the paint and he was super into it. Like we really saw him, it wasn't a, a forceful situation to get mm -hmm. him interested. Like yeah, he was he like, it. yeah, he was so into it. Actually, the OCD was... parent in me was freaking out because there was glitter all over everywhere and we didn't have a big enough tarp. But <laughs> it, wasn't, it actually wasn't finger paint, though. We did use a paintbrush. He yeah. even took the paintbrush and started. Yeah. So, yeah, it was fun to see him do that. And, yes, as OCD parents, we <laughs> want to try to, like, this was in our backyard, but 
keep everything somewhat contained mm-hmm. so there wasn't paint everywhere but it was cool for a short period of time to just let him go and let him like have that freedom to to go for it they come up with it really is yeah absolutely it's like hey i mixed colors for him and then it was just like go ahead and and do what you want to do so um well even like i know like the kids they make all these cool things for the bath like with the different colors and just the creativity of blending the colors and um, just having fun that way too. Now with the situation that we're in now with schooling and where maybe some like states or counties, Mm. you know, every place has different requirements and regulations right now. With art being so tactile, how are you facilitating that for students that are from home right now? It's, it's been a challenge, <laughs> um, but I really have seen it as a positive because I can use materials now that I don't have access to in a classroom. So my one art teacher friend and I made videos on how to paint without paint with like ketchup and mustard, um, food art. Uh, we had them make nature art, like with the sticks and rocks or whatever, making patterns and radial designs uh, and the boxes. Oh, the Amazon, okay? So <laughs> you guys have a plethora of boxes right now. But these kids are making robots as big as themselves. They were giving their dogs body armor. That's it was awesome. crazy. <laughs> That's so cool and creative. And like, what a fun way to think about it. Like what, what are elements that people already have in their home that they could utilize? I'm sure everyone is getting a lot of Amazon packages right now. And mm-hmm. like, you know, even if they're just taking crayons and markers and coloring on an, an empty box or like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, know. he doesn't love that whole big box and making a fort or something like that. I mean, that's creativity right there. Like giving them a box and being like, what can we make? And just let it see where it goes. If there are students that are from home and you're working with them and let's say that they do not have maybe some of the materials, let's say it's not like ketchup mustard day or, you know, just find a box day. How is that working for you and like for other teachers? That's been super hard. Um, the area I'm in, we have something called learning centers and the, even in these learning centers, they're kind of like um, babysitting in the schools. There's an adult in the room but the kid is supposed to have all their stuff. So I have these kids drawing on lines paper and it's driving me insane because I'm like, just, you need a blank piece of paper. <laughs> I also hate lined paper. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you a printer somewhere, grab a piece of paper. Yeah. So that definitely has been a challenge. Uh, our county was able to find funding. I don't know how, maybe grant money or something through the state, but they actually purchased uh, a paint set and crayons for each kid. So awesome. of course they're back ordered <laughs> along with the computers that are back ordered, but they were trying to get some equity in what kids have access to at home with all of the subjects. Wow. Yeah. I could imagine like the challenge that that would pose for parents who, you know, maybe they, they don't have the financial means to you know, yeah, purchase I mean, a lot of extra supplies. I remember art was always expensive. I feel like you'd have to pay like a hundred dollars a semester or, I mean, that was in high school, but I mean, those supplies add up, you know, the paint, paints are expensive. Brushes are expensive. It's a lot. It adds up. Well, like the sketchbooks, I wanted every child to have a sketchbook. Um, so I put that on the supply list. Normally my fifth graders just have sketchbooks, but I asked for everybody because I thought that would guarantee the blank paper thing. And even that was hard to fulfill. Um, sketchbooks can be pricey. And if I was at school, I'd say, oh, you still don't have a sketchbook? Okay, let's make you one. And I take old folders and we put paper in there and I have like colored duct tape or whatever. um, And we make it really exciting and like something they'd want instead of just like, you know, Miss Seiler's old stuff. Um, So I can't do that. And that's kind of a bummer because I can't like pass out stuff. Um, I, I couldn't in the spring. Now I can, but now it's like, well, I have 550 kids. I can't, I can't make all these sketchbooks now, <laughs> but um, definitely make do. And I'm always making sketchbooks or if kids move, I'm like, well, I'll keep your sketchbook. You left it behind <laughs> <laughs> purpose. 
Now yeah. with 550 kids that you see and they're all different ages, you're, you know, you have from like five, six years old up to 10 years old. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that their capabilities and ability to concentrate or complete a task are so different depending on their age. So what are some ways that you found to be very effective to keep them engaged, even if it's a medium that they're interested in, or even a medium not interest that they're not as interested in, depending on age groups. Like, what seems to work well? Um, I think subject matter. It always comes back to subject matter. Figuring out what can hook them in. Um, I like to do projects that they can relate to. Uh, I do a lot of projects about um, like animal shelters and advocating for homeless animals. Uh, they all either had a pet, want a pet, or, you know, they have one now, like something. And then they tell us the stories of grandma's pet or their, their neighbor's pet. Every kid has some kind of, you know, love affair with an animal, basically. So just bringing out that kind of, um, like, something that they can relate to. And also, like, I use a lot of inspiration from books. So we might continue a book or take an idea from a book. And it also helps them, like if I'm bringing in uh, a cultural thing or an art history thing, it really, like if there's a story that goes with it, they really can get into that. So over the 15 years that you've been teaching, there's definitely been a proliferation of like screen time, media time, phone time. Have you seen that, like children in general have a shift towards art since there's been more time on screens and there's just so much stimulation from a screen versus maybe 15 years ago where it could still happen. Like kids are still going to watch cartoons or maybe, you know, play on some device. Um, like what, like what did we have when we were growing up? Like little nin- sketches or like, like video games, mm-hmm. Nintendos, no, that's what I was etch a sketch, but like, uh, <laughs> Have you noticed a difference in just general interest in art in that time frame? I think that it's because of the screen time and because of like t- the TV shows and all that, it's actually more exposure for art. With the iPads, they have all the apps, the art creativity things. Um, and the kids will tell me like they recognize the Mona Lisa from some cartoon they watched or they'll look at something and be like, oh, that was on, you know, Baby Einstein or whatever it is. They make the connection. Like they always recognize Beethoven. If I ever play that, they're like, oh, this is from Baby Einstein. Like it's, that is funny. Um, And of course, I don't always know the cultural references at this point. I'm definitely over that, (laughs) that, you know, bump of just knowing what's hip and cool (laughs) with the kids. Um, So I think of it as like positive, with the screen time, uh, I embrace it. I have the kids doing educational blogs. Um, they get excited if I have out my phone and I'm like, I'm gonna post this on Instagram. They just, they are just re- so excited. I use it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So it's been more of an advantage than like something that has deterred students from wanting to express themselves versus like, yeah. oh, I'll just like go home and play Fortnite and like, you know, play on my phone, but they're like, I mean, I mean, I know your students are younger, mm-hmm. but it's still cool that they just tie it in and it's a seamless aspect. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I try to make that purposefully. So I know some art teachers are really fearful of uh, technology and they kind of back away from it, but I, I just, it, I definitely feel like I hit my stride with the online learning because I already had a basis in the programs we were using and um, I'm young enough that I had access to online (laughs) classes and I participated in them so and I also have had experience teaching online classes before so I felt like yes I can do this and I get my you know coffee breaks and I can go to the bathroom when I want and my dog's right there I mean online learning I think has been great in some aspects. I mean, of course it sucks. We all miss our kids and we want to be in there with them, but I try to always see the glass half full. (laughs) Another initiative that's really important to you that you had shared with us previously was the environmental impact and like the environmental friendliness of 
art and the entire process, the school. So can you talk a little bit about your work in that area and like the strides that you've made? Sure. So I um, use art as a vehicle to teach other things often. And uh, environmental education is at the top of my list. <laughs> I'm always that teacher that says, bring me, bring me your toilet paper rolls and bring me your, you know, box lids and, and coffee containers. And anyway, I really have been chugging away at all that stuff. And I've always wanted to be a green school and I actually had administration that just kind of gave me that push I needed that I didn't need to be the science teacher to lead this initiative. I can be the art teacher and run it. So um, we were able to achieve green school status, which is really exciting. It is state for right now, but you can do it nationally too. Um, so what that entails is every single grade level of the whole school has to do multiple projects. Uh, embedded in their curriculum and then school-wide projects. So I tried to infuse it into my classes every single class I could. Um, we had like first grade outside drawing the trees. I, they literally would take their whiteboards and we'd sit out there and draw the tree that was in front of them. Um, just each one did something different. My fifth graders, they learned about um, pollution in the ocean. So we watched the state of California put together this um, mockumentary a number of years ago is the majestic plastic bag. And it's set up as like, you know, the old National Geographic's with the voiceover. And we watched that and they just, they take notes in their sketchbook about it. And um, we just talk about what impact that has made. And it really got them excited and geared up to do the green school stuff. So, I mean, we were composting, we're making a garden, we have an outdoor classroom. Um, and I always like try to bring the art behind it. So, but it definitely is every single subject. That's, that's pretty cool. I love the idea of using art as a vehicle to talk about other subjects as well, because there's so much that as adults we're bombarded with and our brains even still have a hard time processing it. But for children they they're getting bombarded with it too it's not that they're immune to it but for them they might not necessarily have a way to process it like we do they don't they don't have the freedom to take action in their own homes either the way that we as adults do who are running our own lives we can make choices about i'm going to compost or i want to my next car i want to buy an electric car or whatever it may be where like children have thoughts like this too but they they can't always execute yeah. it so we'll use art to empower them and make them like feel like they have a voice so for my art shows the last couple of years we set up a interactive table where the kids are really talking to adults saying replace your plastic bags with reusables and they have props and they talk to the people that come up to them i mean these are 10 year olds doing this it's it's really awesome because they volunteer to do that and they just get excited. And I always tell them, like, it's not like your parents aren't going to remember to bring the reusable bags. Like, that's your job. You have to remember. Um, so just trying to make them feel like they have some influence and power and art can help them do that. So that's really exciting to share. And there's been a lot this year also regarding like the social injustices that have taken place. And you've also made it a mission to incorporate that into your curriculum, into your art as well. I, I have. And I mean, obviously, the biggest thing for me is sharing um, Black artists that like in a positive way. Like I think a lot of art teachers and teachers in general, it's always these downtrodden stories, but we want to share Black success and um, just just happiness and excitement with it, not just like, oh, these poor people. But um, so I, I think it's fun to talk about that. And there's this really big movement. It's the anti-racist art teacher movement. And they've just done really cool social media things to empower everybody. But I mean, this started for me years ago. I had a student who told me he was being picked on because of his skin color. And I'm like, uh, I just like lost it. I'm like, if anybody ever says anything to you, you come to me and you tell me, like just making sure they have a safe place 
they feel like they can talk to you and approach you about it. And he, he was really funny. He ended, he's like, you're a bully buster. And I'm like, why, what is that? And he's like, you, you, you stop people from being mean and you won't let anybody be mean. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. A bully buster. <laughs> okay. But it's definitely a project. Well, it's also what a nice way to weave it into the real life scenarios that we're all facing. Like we're, you know, we're, we all live on this planet together. We need to take care of our earth. We all live collectively together as human beings on this planet. And we need to take care of each other regardless of what we look like. And it's such important messages and values that can easily be explained or intertwined into something where if children are working with their hands and it's very tactile versus just reading it in a book, th- that probably makes a much bigger impression on them than yeah, yeah. just like why, like why they're doing something. Yeah. Like, oh, I read this in a book and I remember some of the dates cause it was on a test, but like, whatever, I don't, I don't remember the rest of it kind of thing. It, it just doesn't have the same connection. Yeah. Now, with the kids, are you primarily like watercolors? Like as far as, I guess, per ages, I mean, are you, I mean, I don't want to sound, uh, I guess, um, with the kids, do you do like macaroni necklaces when they're like five or like when they get up to 11? Are, are they doing um, ceramics? Do you cer- do ceramics with them? I guess what's kind of, What's the different mediums that you do with the kids at the certain ages? I don't know that we went over that really. So well. um, for my county, the curriculum's super open. Um, and I don't know how else it is everywhere, but I imagine it's about the same. So we have for every single grade level, there's drawing, there's painting, there's uh, 3D, and there's printing. Uh, and then my county has something called paper and fibers, which pretty much as anything involving like yarn or string or fabric. So each grade level is going to dip their toes into that. And then each year you circle around and it becomes a little bit more hard. So for example, kindergarten is learning um, basic shapes for drawing. And then first grade would learn basic shapes that create a, a composition. So each one, it's like a building block that goes a little bit deeper. And then by third grade, they're learning about overlapping and how that might create depth. And then fourth and fifth graders are getting into perspective and shading. And once I I circle around to the perspective and shading part, I I tell them, I'm like, you're going to forget all of this. In your middle school, our teacher is going to teach you again. And you might remember it, you might not. But don't worry, if you take art in high school, your high school teacher will teach all of this again. So it's kind of like a running joke between the the schools, like they, they just forget it all. But I, I try to tell them like, don't beat yourself up over it because your brain might not be ready to wrap your head around the concept of perspective or shading to make something look 3D. So we definitely have all those units. So for example, with kindergarten printing, it's just stamping stuff you know, dipping gadgets into paint and making a pattern or impression or something. But, and then my favorite kindergarten lesson is we do clay donuts. So I'll give them pieces of clay and, oh, it's the best. We pull up um, a donut website and we talk about their favorite donuts and <laughs> we watch them go through the conveyor belts and get the glaze poured on them. And then- Oh my God. Do- <laughs> Fractur- fractured prune donuts, right? Yeah, That's- yeah, well- <laughs> In, Har- in Harper County, they have, they had something else. I don't know. It went out of business already. You feel bad. All they know Krispy is Dunkin Creams. Donuts. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts for everything. Yeah, there you go. As a prego, thinking about watching videos of glazed donuts sounds like exactly what I want to do right now. But <laughs> like, then if you're in school and you're making donuts that you can't eat, that's almost I torturous. I know, and I'm not allowed to give them food. So <laughs> <laughs> we could. But then we make it a big game. So I'll go to Dunkin' Donuts and be the person that asks for the empty box. <laughs> and they look at me like I'm insane. I'm like, it's for an art project. They need an empty box. <laughs> and then for our art show, I tell the kids, like, we're going to trick the parents. And we're going to put our clay donuts in the real donut box. Mm. Shut the box so then they open it. Um, That's how you get grounded in my house. 
funny. Yeah, you might... like, come here, dad, come here, mom. I have yeah. to show you, look. And then, <laughs> oh, you can have a donut. <laughs> yeah, there's one donut left and it's kind of like brownish and it's got a couple weird looking sprinkles on it. Yeah, oh, that looks delicious, son. Let me try that. I, will, no. I would still Pretty, eat it. Really like break your tooth. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good gag. I would be making donut holes if I was that kid. We have some kids that do that. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> there you go. Have the ones doing like a bear claw or like oh, nice. a figure eight ones. It's yeah. So or you get the kids who try to do a crawler. Those are the kids who are going to go to the GT classes. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you are a parent and you begin to notice, like, let's say that um, they're, you know, your child's in school you begin to notice that they really have an affinity for art mm -hmm. and they're really taking off in it and they love it and it seems to be important to them. How can parents nurture that for their children at home? Uh, I think the biggest way parents can nurture creativity if it's seen is just exposure, getting them into anything they can get them into, whether it is a free thing at the library um, or it's something at a community college summer camps. I mean, I know some people like have different uh, affordability, but the, co the community colleges are a great resource. They have day camps for art. Uh, they have um, after school things. Rec councils are another affordable place to find art lessons. And it'll be a small group too. So you don't have to like go out and get private lessons. You can just look at your local rec council or your community college. Um, and then the library always the libraries are really stepping up their game. Uh, hopefully it's the same where you're at, but they really are taking pulse points of the community and assessing their community needs. So they are um, putting workshops for all different age groups and they're doing arts and all kinds of different activities, which is really awesome to see. There was a period of time prior to COVID that we were looking into like art classes, music classes, and some like, ball classes. yeah, like introduction to sports classes mm -hmm. for our son. But then everything was sort of put on hold for the time being. If you're a parent where you're maybe a little nervous to mm -hmm. like have your child join in with a group of other kids, are there any resources that you really like if it's like maybe a YouTube channel or anything like that, that you could recommend that yeah. kids could use at home? I feel like um, one of my friends who has a three-year-old, her son is doing uh, online music classes. So they are, you know, drumming and doing steady beats and all that kind of stuff on the computer. But she mentioned that he has a hard time um, staying engaged with it since it's on the computer. So honestly, like it depends on your kid if they if they don't have enough screen time and it's okay for them to do the YouTube videos because I, I think that can be a rabbit hole sometimes. Um, but the there's one site and it's also like what you want. Like if you want a guided drawing, the Art Hub for Kids is great. It's a dad. And he has like a whole slew of kids from like two years old to like, I don't know, 12 years old. And he does uh, split screen drawing. And so the kid will draw on one side and he'll draw on the other. And uh, my kindergartners, that's like, if I have to do class coverage in a classroom, that's what I put on. Uh, they are, you can just drop a pin in that class. They are glued to their paper. They're following every step. It will definitely buy you five to 15 minutes of quiet <laughs> uh, it's called art hub for kids and but it's very guided so if you want your kid to do something a little bit more free or open you might want to just give them materials and just have them experiment with that um, or give them an idea uh, like a subject like nature or baseball or if you want to be really abstract like draw love or something mm. like that um, but it's hard with the screen time thing right now, I think. Yes, our child is pretty young. We probably wouldn't set him in, in front of a screen. He wouldn't necessarily pick up on what's happening. But I love the idea of just having like a mix of materials and saying like, here you go, go ahead and play. But for children that are a little bit older, maybe used to like watching a show or used to following direction in that way I could see how that could be beneficial like yeah and like you know, if you do origami on. or something or something different um I've heard great things for the kids the tactile 
who want something tactile about the um the special kind of sand that's not messy have you seen that no and i need to know about this <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like play-doh but it's sand and it's not messy at all they always at the craft stores here they always have it like at the register um it has a special name i think it might be called like kinetic sand or something like that but it gives you that feeling of sand, but it's not messy so <laughs> Okay, well, it, like you said, like you as a parent and as teachers too, we have our set limits of what kind of mess we can tolerate. <laughs> so, I mean, I always recommend to just go outside, <laughs> have art outside if you're worried about messes. <laughs> yeah, we will figure out what that sand is and link it in the show notes for everyone because I think that might be uh, something that we're Amazoning over this weekend. <laughs> Now you've been doing this for 15 years. Yes. And it's been primarily K through five. Mm -hmm. um, now, have you had any students go on beyond your classes and like come back to you and be like, Hey, I've loved your art class. And now I'm drawing cartoons. For I haven't had crazy success stories, but the ones that go to art colleges is always for an art teacher. If you have a student that makes it to an art college, that's a huge win because they're so competitive to get in and so difficult. So I've had a couple students do that. And then a couple other students that I just nurtured the creativity, they are like um, into making, producing videos and like doing short films. And that's really awesome to see too. Uh, so I've definitely seen that. Um, and just seeing with the protest recently for the Black Lives Matter movement, some of my former students are leading these protests and that to me is like just mind blowing that they're the ones up there organizing at 16 to 18 years old, making posters and using social media to get the word out. So that's, that really makes an art teacher proud. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Especially thinking about how important it is to you and how you weave in some of these subjects. I mean, of course, as 18 year olds, they were not having that experience you know, many years ago, but it's, it's like universal messages mm -hmm. that you get to see them have a voice about and express themselves. That's probably what it all comes down to. Like mm -hmm. being able to feel creative, having the confidence to express yourself, mm -hmm. no matter what that looks like. If you could leave the audience with a key takeaway, what would that be? Uh, that art and creativity are for everybody. It doesn't matter if your child grows up to be an artist or not, creativity and art are gonna help them in any career they pick, any job at all. Um, because artists like have a certain way of thinking and problem solving. And that's what we wanna encourage in the kids and to take risk and fail and get back up again. So um, there's something called artist habits of mind. So that's something cool you can look up to. But the, I mean, that's for everybody, not just the kids that grew up to be real artists. And what are, I know we talked about some of them, but what are some key resources that you would like to leave for the audience as well? Um, I think that if you are a parent that likes to assist your kid, uh, Cassie Stevens is great. She posts a lot of videos of how to, and then she posts content just for kids too. So she's kind of amazing. Uh, another art teacher I really love is Mrs. Eddington and she has an Instagram handle that's awesome too. She does really cool things for adaptive kids. Um, so if you have a special needs or a kid that is not having the motor skill that you think they should for that age or something, she has some really good resources for that. Um, um, and then for adults, just like, one of my favorite books is Art Before Breakfast. And it's just like a one page, a little paragraph, and it'll tell you like, draw your breakfast. <laughs> so you can spend five minutes to draw. And it really could just be that. So if you're like a adult that wants to have more creativity, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It's just getting the mind thinking creative, like in a creative way. It has to be a bowl of oranges and apples though, like still life, right? <laughs> That's a, not just a box of cinnamon toast crunch. Well, you just have to make it look artistic, you know, and have yes. the box spilling or a yeah, spill. nice <laughs> canted angle. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Yeah. And outside of the work that you do in your school system, you also do have, you will take commission work. You do have an Etsy store as well. So shout yourself out. Where can everyone find you? 
Uh, I am on Etsy. My shop is called A Cup of Amber. <laughs> I started with that name because I was making little polymer bowls. Um, but my, my specialty, I guess, is in watercolor. Uh, I do these things, or I call them watercolor collages, <laughs> where I work with a um, person to design a collage. And it's usually about a couple and where they come from and how their lives come together and just symbols that show that their journey. And it usually ends up being a wedding gift, but it can be for anybody, really. <laughs> That's awesome. And then you also have an Instagram account for your school as well. I do. So my school uh, Instagram is RFE art and I really try to focus it on the kids and share their art on there. So if you want to check that out, that, that would be awesome too. And if anybody wanted to reach out to you to connect with you, what would be the best way? Um, I am really all about Instagram. So <laughs> sending messages on Instagram would, would be fine. And of course you can look me up uh, on the Etsy. There's messaging on there too. Yeah. So cool. you can slide into Amber's DM <laughs> if it is art related. Art related <laughs> inquiries only people. <laughs> All right. Well, Amber, thank you so much for joining us. We love this. Appreciate all of your insights. Facilitating creativity is something that's important to both of us. Mm -hmm. We like to try to keep ourselves creative mm -hmm. and then hopefully something we can pass down to our child. And Art is forever. It's eternal. You know, yeah. it starts from the Parthenon before then. And, you know, we see it everywhere. So it's ingraining it in the children and the culture. I mean, that's what keeps us for generations and generations. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is amazing and beautiful. And it's wonderful to, you know, see that within the little kids and then watch them grow up and just all of it is really awesome. So thank you for your service for our kids. Yes, and not just for art, but just being a teacher and all that you do for children everywhere. Mm -hmm. So much love for teachers. So we thank you. Thank you for joining us to Elevate the Vibe. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there, Vibe Hive babes. If this podcast has brought you any value, please rate and review on your favorite listening platform. And if you're feeling really generous, share with a friend. Visit us at elevatethevibe.co for show notes on this episode and previous episodes. This podcast is intended to educate, entertain, and inspire. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or substitute for professional medical advice please consult your healthcare provider with any questions you may have. And as always, thank you for joining us to Elevate the Vibe.